This morning we're going to consider mercy, the topic of Christ's mercy. In our exposition through the book of Matthew, we're in Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 75 is the text we'll be reading in just a few minutes. You may not intuitively see the mercy of Christ in this text, but I believe it is very much there, especially when we consider it with other texts of Scripture. Mercy, just as a topic itself, is a beautiful but often misunderstood quality. Showing mercy is some is withholding negative consequences that someone has earned by their sinful failures against you. So when you show mercy, you're choosing not to give them the consequences for what they have done. That usually stands in contrast to grace, which grace is giving somebody something they haven't deserved yet or will never deserve. Mercy tends to mean the idea of you're withholding some negativity on them, some, some attack, some judgment on them that they've rightfully earned. To have the right to bestow mercy on someone, you must be the one that they have failed or sinned against. If you break the state law, it is not mercy for me who has no legal authority to decide I'm not going to hold any judgment against you. I, I wasn't sinned against. I wasn't violent. I wasn't offended. Therefore, I don't have the right to give you mercy. So mercy can only be given by one who has been offended by someone. That's what mercy means. Furthermore, mercy can only be granted by one who, who in that particular circumstance has some greater level or superiority. So a king can grant mercy to a subject, but a servant or a subject of the king cannot grant mercy to the king. Mercy always flows from the stronger to the weaker, from the high to the low. It is not merciful for a weak person to withhold judgment against a stronger person. That's just wisdom. So mercy always flows from the one who has been offended, who is in a position of strength, to the offender who is in a position of weakness. From the greater to the lesser. This text of scripture we're going to read, this account we have of Peter's public denial of Jesus. Just as Jesus had prophesied to him, this does not speak directly of Christ's mercy. In fact, it's quite curious that Matthew, um, the author of this text, does not mention Peter ever again in his book. But though this account of Peter's denial in Matthew does not speak explicitly of Christ's mercy, it does say something quite profound about the stark contrast between Jesus and Peter. And it's impossible, especially with, in light of other texts of Scripture, not to see the deep mercy of Jesus Christ for his failing disciple. We often don't like to see ourselves in the story as the loser. We often don't like to see ourselves in the story as the failure, as Peter. And yet I would encourage you, dear friends, if you don't see yourselves as the weak, failing disciple, you will never experience the joy of what it means to be the one who has received the mercy of the sovereign king. So we must see ourselves as Peter and then rejoice in the mercy of Christ. The Apostle Paul says that where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And while he argues in Romans 5 and 6 where that particular verse is found, that it's not an excuse to live sinfully, the mercy of God indeed, for we who are often just like Peter, not only does something magnificent for us, but more importantly, and catch this, the mercy of Christ actually does something radical in us. It actually transforms us. And we'll see that in Peter's life. 
It changes our hearts and desires. Divine mercy motivates us when we fall in sinfulness unto repentance and obedience for the glory of Christ. I wish to read the holy text of scripture, inspired word of God, explain a little bit about what happened historically as we did last week, explain a little bit historically, then consider some more of more scriptures related to this account um, and think about theological lessons or spiritual lessons from this and then close the sermon today with practical implications for our lives. So look at Matthew 26 beginning in verse 69. Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he, def- he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Father, help us with your word today to understand it, to apply it appropriately to our lives, to be convicted by it, and to be changed by it. You have spoken to us in this beautiful text of scripture, this word of God. May we not be guilty of disregarding the holy word of God, the holy speech of God. We can, maybe we consider ourselves in light of Peter's failure. May we also see Jesus today and glorify him. Holy Spirit, help us as your people and help me as I teach your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Of course, we know that Jesus had predicted to the disciples while they ate their last Passover meal that all of them would leave him in his darkest hour. Peter had boldly declared, if you remember from our study, that though everyone else would desert the Christ, he most certainly would not. Now then Jesus tells Peter personally and plainly, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now this had to have been quite insulting to Peter if you think about it. Others, yes, but not me. I'll die for you. He was certain he would stand and fight for Christ, though Christ had never asked him to stand and fight for him. He was certain of that. But Jesus was now telling him he would not only flee, he would turn to the other side. He would fight against him. He would deny him. He would be against, opposed to Christ. And he would do it publicly. And this night, now Peter is certainly thinking through these things carefully. So after supper and after Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Peter and the rest cannot stay awake and take a nap, When they find themselves surrounded by officers with clubs and swords, he quickly draws his sword. Here's the time to stand and fight for Christ and violently slashes away, cutting off a servant's ear in the process. And Jesus shocks Peter when he rebukes this violent action because he doesn't need Peter. Now that had to be a blow to the apostle who's proving above all to his Lord that I will not deny you. And now Jesus basically says, I don't need you, Peter. I I could dispatch 12 legions of angels. I don't need you. You know, that's quite humbling when someone tells you they don't need you. It's quite devastating to a proud man to be told, you're really not helping anything out here. In fact, I'm going to take your show of strength and I'm going to heal the person you just struck down. And so Jesus healed the ear of the man who Peter wildly slashed. This had to have affected Peter emotionally and mentally, knowing that I had Jesus back. Does he not have mine? 
whatever the case may be, Peter, as it says in our text previously, in verse 58, Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. He doesn't know what's gonna happen. He's confused by all of this. He's confused by Jesus. He's confused by himself. He's confused by everything that he had planned and everything that he had thought is now crashing around him. And as this happens, as Jesus is arrested, as Jesus promised, all the disciples flee and forsake him, mighty Peter included. But Peter has to come back in order to deny him. And so he comes back. So while Jesus is being led before Annas and then Caiaphas, we find Peter turning back uh, after the heat has subsided. And he goes back to kind of sneak in to see what's going on. Now a little account, this little account of Peter's denial is recorded in all four Gospels. For some reason, it is one of the few occasions where the four Gospel writers each write it a little bit differently and make it one of the most difficult paragraphs in the entire four Gospels to harmonize. Um, Who would have thought such a small little detail would would be difficult to harmonize. In other words, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's account, they all seem a little different. And, and even in the fact that, that Mark, or, or Mark suggests that it was the same girl that accused him twice, and Matthew suggests it was a different one. Um, John has it before Annas and rearranged order and then a gap between it. And Luke tells it a little bit differently, and it's caused many critics of the Bible to... Um, scoff and to say, ah, see, it's, it's, there's error. One of them made an error. Somebody made a mistake here. It is difficult. I'm not going to deny that, although I, I will defend the scripture. There is no error here. The reason why it's difficult to harmonize is because it is such a brief account. We don't have all the details. We don't know all that happened. If we open our minds up to recognizing that this took place during the evening from at least probably around midnight until the rising of the sun, Peter's denial or all these things taking place takes place in about six hours worth of time. So there's a lot of details that are not told us here. For example, the gap that John has between one denial and the other two is probably because John recounts for us Jesus' um, arrest and trial before um, Annas, but not Caiaphas. And probably he denied once there at Annas' house and then there's a gap and then he's taken to Caiaphas' house and then he denies twice there. Caiaphas and Annas lived in the same areas in the temple court, so the same place, which is why we have um, Peter out the courtyard and then out of the gate, moving between them. So that's just a... For you to understand that if you think about it in broad terms and with openness, you recognize that it all fits together. And also with all these people, Luke describes it as many people, um, they accused him. And so likely when it says that a servant girl is, she's probably just one of many who accused him. And Matthew is just showing us that, I believe, for a contrast, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so there really isn't disagreement if you recognize that they're giving us, as, as described by theologians, the uh, voice of God, voice of Christ, not the words of Christ, right? The Gospels give us the account of what happened. They don't tell us every single little detail along the way. But it is understandable and reconcilable and we, all four accounts help us realize there were three times just as Jesus had predicted that he would deny Christ. Mark does suggest a rooster crow, crowing more than once but with the way Matthew described it in Jesus' prophecy before the rooster crows that technically means before the rooster's done crowing, before it's all done, before it's all said and done, roosters might crow more than once Before it's all said and done, you will have denied me three times. In other words, before the rooster crows is just an idiom for before morning. Before morning, you'll have denied me three times. One of the things that comes out clearly, though, in the story, especially in Matthew here, is the progressively angry and anxious denials of Peter. Did you notice that when we read it? How it's progressively getting angry and anxious? It increases in hostility. First, he is accused by a servant girl of simply being with Jesus, to which Peter replies with a simple answer and an escape out of the courtyard to the gateway. I do not know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're saying. But the pressure mounts. And soon he's accused a second time. Peter's a little more nervous now, so he denies with an oath. 
<coughs> what does that mean with an oath? It does not mean that he used filthy language or curse words. It means that he swore on something greater than him. He, he made a promise, an oath before God. Fascinating that it's, this is probably happening almost exactly at the same time that Caiaphas is telling Jesus, I put you under oath before the living God. Tries to bind Jesus to an oath to declare if he's the Messiah. And Peter binds himself to an oath. The very thing Jesus forbade back in the Sermon on the Mount. Binding him to an oath. And Jesus moves from being, I don't know what you're talking about, to and from being what Peter describes as the Christ, his Lord, his, his master, the one he would die for, to being the man. I don't know the man. I, I never heard of that guy. I don't know what you're talking about. You see a progressive nature there. If you don't see it there, you obviously, I think, could see it in the third one, right? Because the, Matthew tells us that not only now did Peter um, deny Christ, but he began to curse and to, to swear or to, to, to give oaths. That also does not mean he used foul language, likely. It means that he began to swear by everything he could. The idea there is he's crying out under pressure. And he's using every oath he can think of in order to convince the people accusing him that he's not who they want. Now what's fascinating about it is Peter's afraid. He's anxious. He's afraid of being captured and being killed and he doesn't know what to do. And the reality is if they'd wanted Peter dead, they probably could have done that when he cut Malchus' ear off. If they'd wanted to arrest the other 11 disciples, they certainly could have done that in the garden. These are servants. These aren't the, legal, the authorities. These are servants accusing him. But Peter's overcome by fear and anxiety. He can't get away from the accusations. Let the logos be true. Let Christ be true, though Peter a liar. Because he does know him. He knows what she's talking about. He knows it all. He's lying. And he's called out for it. He calls down curses upon himself. Well, that, that calls down swears and curses. That idea, may God strike me dead if I'm telling a lie here. That's the kind of language that he's using likely there. I think that Matthew and the other gospel writers want us to feel the moment, not just to know it factually. Well, Matthew doesn't bring this up. Luke says that at this point, the Lord turned and looked at Peter just before the rooster crows. What a packed statement. Lord turned and looked at him. Likely through a window or perhaps while he was passing and I think this is most likely after they'd already declared Jesus guilty and worthy of death. Remember they convene a second time in the temple courts with all of the Sanhedrin in order to pronounce the formal legal judgment at daybreak on him. That's Matthew 27 tells us that the first verses. This is probably as they're leading the accused. Now convicted, beaten, Spit dripping down his beard, his face bruised and mocked as they're kicking him along and binding and, ki and pushing him as he's through there from one courtyard to the temple courts and there's Peter warming himself and Jesus turns and looks at him. I don't know what that look looked like but I do think we know what it felt like because the Bible says that immediately when Jesus looked at Peter, the rooster crowed and he remembered the words of Jesus and he went out and he wept bitterly. As dark as this feels for Peter, there actually is a glimmer of hope because Peter first remembers the words of Jesus. See, all he'd been doing to this point was thinking of himself, but now he remembers the word of Jesus. Now his attention turns from himself to Jesus the one who had been a friend to him. Been more than a friend to him. He'd been his Lord and his God. He'd saved him from sinking in the water. He'd calmly, he'd kindly rebuked him, sometimes more stern than other times, and he'd brought him up to the mountain with him to see the glory of God. Peter remembers, thinks about Jesus. And this thinking of Jesus and what he prophesied concerning Peter's failure and the exact way in which it took place just as Jesus said. Nothing Jesus says can fail and Peter knows this and he re recognizes this. Peter is devastated. He is nobody after all. Jesus doesn't need him after all. He's worthless, useless, useless. 
And that's the best place Peter could ever be. While Peter is so low, there is one glimmer of hope in this. He First, he thinks of Jesus, but second, he has not lost the ability to weep over himself and his depravity. My friends, the chief mark that one is in danger of apostasy is an inability to weep over their wickedness. Can you weep over your wickedness? The scripture, Corinthians, makes it clear that repentance is not only emotional sorrow, weeping over sin, but that godly sorrow is the first step in the right path to true repentance. And Peter, he's on the right path, and it's not the path he thought he would be on. He's hurt himself. Jesus has looked at him. He's remembered Jesus, and so he weeps over his sin. And so a spark of hope is yet found in the troubled hearts of the once famous, now devastated disciple. This is what happens, a very simple, straightforward, historical account. But I want to consider the theology of it. What's going on here? While Peter's terrible fall is tragic, we can think about the issue in theological terms. That is, we can consider how this bold disciple moves from bold follower to lying coward, how that shows us ourselves and our God. First, we notice Jesus versus Peter. Matthew, remember, does this a lot. He contrasts. He'll pit against one another. He'll show how one side and then the other side. And he does that very thing here by showing Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin and following that up with Peter's denial before the servants. And it's very stark contrast indeed. On the one hand, we see Jesus, who is absolutely unfazed by one of the most powerful, deliberative bodies and one of the most powerful men in Israel, the high priest. The lies of the false witnesses cannot move him. The physical abuse will not stop him. The threats of Caiaphas do nothing against him. Peter himself, later on in his life, when he writes a letter to the churches, he writes about Jesus in awe of this. And Peter himself writes nearly 30 years later, he says this about Jesus, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Peter was writing about that night. And he's writing about that he sees Jesus and what Peter thinks of now, 30 years later, he thinks of Jesus and he's awed by Jesus. Peter's problem 30 years before he writes that was he was awed with himself. He was infatuated with his ability, with his strength, with his wisdom. So how does Peter go from being infatuated with himself to being infatuated with Christ and his beauty? Mercy of Christ. So Peter, on the other hand, is but facing an inquisitive servant girl. Jesus stands before the high priest. Peter stands next to a servant girl and he crumbles like an old newspaper. He's brought to oaths and lies because of the questioning of an insignificant servant girl standing outside the courtyard. So while Jesus confidently is silent before his accusers so that they'll find him guilty so that he could die for you and me and Peter, Peter is bombastically lying before his accusers so that he might live to run and hide. Now don't take this to be an attack against Peter. Peter. For in Peter's denial of Christ, all sinners find themselves. I find myself and you find yourself. Theologically, at some point, we are all Peter. We cannot win in our trials. We cannot be bold enough. We cannot do enough to impress an infinite God. Yet Jesus, who is God, come in the flesh, is completely impressive. He is unlike Peter and he's unlike you and he's unlike me. And thus he, unlike us, is capable of being the mediator between us and God. 
because he's not Peter. <laughs> Thank the Lord, he's not like Peter. He stands in the trial bold. Again, we're shown by Matthew in this contrast, the great gulf of holiness, the great gulf of courage, honor, glory, and power that exists between Jesus Christ, King of Kings, and you and I and Peter. And none can cross this gulf. It is massive. So we see Jesus versus Peter in this context. We see the, con the contrast. And the power and perfection of Jesus contrasted with the fear and failure of Peter implies for us that Christ is greater and we are the lesser. But remember, that's actually a good thing, right? Because mercy always flows from the greater to the lesser. Embrace that you're lesser. Embrace your Peter-likeness. Because then the mercy of Christ can flow to you. Peter's only hope is that God would be merciful to him, a cowardly, lying, cursing wretch. And our only hope is indeed the same, that God be merciful to us, cowardly, lying, cursing wretches. The good news is, my dear friends, is that if you are looking for mercy and you are looking to Jesus Christ, then you are indeed looking in the right place. But if you are looking for validation as you are, if you are looking for acceptance based upon how you might do something impressive, if you are looking for a little hand up, just a little help along the way, that you might make yourself a better person through what you might do, then you will always find yourself looking up without mercy. But if you are simply, humbly, lowly, coming to Jesus Christ, and like Peter at the end, grieving over your wretchedness, you will find, my dear friends, that there is an everlasting wideness of mercy in the Son of God. There is always room for those who truly remember the word of Christ and go out and weep bitterly over their wretchedness. There's always room. And though this text ends here, it doesn't explicitly teach us about Christ's mercy. It is plainly there in the implications. But more than that, if we would just expand our gaze outside of this small text for a minute, we would see the mercy of Jesus Christ for Peter and for us all over in this story. Or as the late Paul Harvey would say, let us discover the rest of the story. Look with me over in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 16. This is one of those verses in the scripture that when I read it, I have to read it several times. Not because it's difficult to understand, because it's so simple yet so profound. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus has risen from the day. Three days after Peter's denial, right? Jesus has risen from the grave. He's won. Salvation is accomplished. These women go to the tomb. They enter into the tomb and Jesus isn't there. And they're excited about this. But, but then suddenly right there in front of them there is a, an angel standing there or sitting. There's an angel there. And he says this in verse six. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. Did you catch that? But go, tell his disciples and make sure you tell Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. Make sure Peter knows that Jesus is waiting for him. Make sure Peter knows that he's coming for him. Why be so personal with one disciple in this account? Why mention Peter's name? Why not say, tell John, tell Andrew, tell Thomas? They all ran away. Because the Holy Spirit wants these women to go to Peter and say, it's not over, Peter. There's a wideness in the Savior's mercy. There's a wideness in his mercy for you, Peter. Peter. If you turn over to John chapter 21, 
you'll see Jesus in Galilee now when he encounters Peter. John tells us what happened when they got to Galilee. Several of the disciples are fishing on the Tiberias Lake, but even as seasoned fishermen, their nets brought nothing that night. Now morning comes and Jesus, though they did not know it was him, is standing on the shore. So he calls out, children, have you any food? He knows the answer. The answer is no. So he tells them to cast their net on the other side, the right side of the boat. And miraculously, because they surely had been casting their nets all over the lake that night, but miraculously now, as they pull them in, their nets can't hold the fish that are now caught. And Jesus is telling them once again, see, I told you I would go before you into Galilee. You don't need, I, I don't need you, you need me. That's what he's telling him. I don't need you, you need me. So right away, John recognizes who it is. And so he turns over and whispers to Peter, it is the Lord. What does Peter do? Look, look at what Peter does. In verse um, seven, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he'd removed it and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with the fish. Now, people speculate as to why it is that Peter jumped in the sea. I think the context makes it actually pretty clear here. It says the others came in the boat. That means how did Peter come? He, he didn't come in the boat, right? He swam. They had the nets of fish. Peter didn't care about the fish anymore. Jesus was there. And so he dives into the lake and he swims to Jesus. Judas feels guilt over his sin and he thinks of himself and he goes and hangs himself. Peter feels guilt over his sin and this is the difference between feeling shame and guilt and repenting in shame and guilt. Peter runs to Jesus. The repentant run to Jesus, not from him, but run to him. Peter can't get there fast enough. So they're sitting there and once again, remember, Jesus didn't need them, they needed him, so they bring the fish in, you know, here, look at the fish we caught. Of course, you told us where to fish, but, but they get there and Jesus has already got breakfast cooked for them. They didn't need the fish after all because he already has fish there. So again, they don't, he doesn't need them, they need him, so he cooks breakfast for them. Verse 12 Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Whether he's speaking of the fish or he's speaking of the disciples, I'm not sure. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again, again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is not an exposition of John, so we're not gonna get into all the different nuances in this question of do you love me? What I wanna point out is Peter sitting there eating fish breakfast. Why would Jesus want him to feed his sheep? Why would he want Peter to shepherd his lambs. That's all, that's the past. I mean, yes, back when I stood with you on the Mount of Transfiguration, back when we saw all these things and saw your miracles, that made sense then. That made sense. But now it's too, it's too late. I've, you, you know what I've done. Why would Jesus 
want Peter to do what he'd called him in the beginning to do. What does he say to him at the end? Verse 19, this he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Just follow me, Peter. My weak and failing beloved brothers and sisters, there is a wideness in Christ's mercy that can never be measured by human effort. There is a grace, that God, a grace in God that cannot be explained with human tongue. There is a love for sinners that not only brings sinners to repentance, but calls them to serve him, to follow him, to feed his sheep out of their repentance. Out of their weakness. Last week, we noted Christ's perfection is essential truth to the gospel, his holiness, his impeccability, and mingled with the perfection and holiness of Christ is the inexpressible mercy in the same holy God, and the mercy of God is just as essential to the gospel truth than the perfect righteousness of God. My friends, remember, Mercy is only ever for the weak and only bestowed by the strong. In fact, it's necessary that Christ be understood as holy, undefiled, and perfect in every way before mercy can even be given. A weak soul cannot grant mercy to the strong, but the strong can give mercy to the weak. And so our Lord and God having proved in his trial and through his cross and by his resurrection, his divine and infinite power and perfection and righteousness has chosen to now show mercy to the most foolish, the weakest, and the most insignificant and failing of all. And he calls him to serve him. Not out of guilt, not out of shame, but because of mercy. But it's important we understand that mercy is not so much what God does for us, but what Christ does in us. And that's what we see before us. Mercy is not the removal of consequence for our wretchedness alone. God's mercy is not just in Christ letting us go, but actually God's mercy is that Christ holds us fast. That is the mercy of God that he changes us from the inside, that he gives us new birth, new life, new hope, that he makes us a new creation. That is the mercy of Christ. See, the mercy of God was not that he let Peter run away. The mercy of God that he went before Peter, refused to let Peter get away. The mercy of Christ that he said, I'm gonna go before you into Galilee. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep and follow me. Peter, my mercy compels you. I love you. This is the mercy of God. Some with a very perverted view of God's mercy look upon the mercy of Christ as a means to be free from restraint, as a means to be free to pass, get a free pass to wallow in wretchedness and sinfulness and to shrug our shoulders presuming, well, God's a merciful God. But when God demonstrates his mercy to us and when we in weakness understand his mercy, it is not releasing us and we understand that this is not releasing us to the depravity of our will. Christ's mercy transforms us, changes us, equips us and enables us to truly honor and glorify a merciful God. Mercy motivates. In Acts chapter 2, we see the fruit of mercy that Christ shows to Peter in John 21. For in Acts chapter 2, Peter becomes bold again. Bold Peter is back. But this time, if you read the sermon that he preaches in his boldness, it's nothing about himself. He doesn't talk about himself at all. He talks about one person in his sermon the entire time. He talks about, he quotes scripture after scripture and all he can talk about in his sermon is Jesus. It's all he can talk about because Peter has learned that the mercy of Christ compels him to see and behold and worship and serve Jesus with everything that he has. Divine mercy 
when received humbly and by faith alone miraculously transforms sinners into saints, the hopeless into the hopeful, cowards to bold servants and deniers into preachers. It's amazing. Thus, my dear friends, my brothers and sisters, beloved of God, all service to God is only as effective as you and I understand the depth of our weakness, the greatness of Christ, and his mercy to save us. All ministry in your home, in your church, in your neighborhood flows from your weakness because of Christ's strength on account of his great mercy. Always be overwhelmed at the mercy of Jesus for you. And I would just challenge you practically. The minute you or I begin to think that we are beyond the mercy of Christ is the minute we are walking down a dangerous road of apostasy. The minute we begin to compare ourselves with another, we're walking down a dangerous road. As soon as we begin to see ourselves as the hero of any story, we're walking down a dangerous road. In other words, my friends, as soon as we take our mind's eye, our spirit's eye off of Jesus Christ, we're walking down a dangerous road. Friends, my beloved, sing with confidence. Remember the words of Jesus. Consider him. Sing with words of confidence. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. Your Savior loves you so. He will hold you fast.